I'm going to talk to you today about uh, sudden cardiac arrest and what you should know about it. And most of the people feel that the sudden cardiac death or having a sudden death is like having a heart attack, but the two things are different. So I'm going to talk to you about that. I think you perhaps already know of me, uh, but I'm the chairman of Fortis Scott's Heart Institute and chairman of Cardiology Council of the Fortis Group of Hospitals. I've been the past president of the Cardiological Society of India and have been active in aspects of cardiology, both clinical cardiology as well as angioplasty, as you all are aware. Now, we realize that we're living in the, in this schools, or I would say an epidemic of heart disease in India. Uh, heart disease in India is running over the last 40 years, while deaths from heart disease have been following in the rest of the world and uh, clearly it is the number one killer even in the next five years 50% of the uh, of the world from heart disease are going to happen in India so in a way heart disease and heart attacks are actually the biggest killer in India and India can not just be called the world's capital of heart disease but we can call it the world's crematorium of heart disease so 24 lakh people dying from heart disease every year in India uh, you may have, may have heard of all this. Uh, you have heard of uh, of the fact that there have been cardiac arrests of footballers on the field, uh, and there have been people dying. All, all. I mean, you've heard of footballers. You've heard of other important people dying from heart disease. But here's a very important video of a death of an international uh, Italian football player, which happened two years ago. And look at him. He was playing football, and this, there he is. And, and as they, and and soon you'll see uh, this footballer very happy, and suddenly he just collapses. And as he collapsed, people thought that he'd been hurt, but soon everybody started realizing that he actually died, and he just passed out. That was a sudden cardiac arrest. Ambulance came, but every effort that they made could not revive him. This happened to another footballer, as you know, in, in, in England. And that footballer in England was actually, he collapsed, he had a sudden cardiac death on the, on the pitch. And luckily there was a doctor in the, in, 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 the, uh, in the people who were watching the football who rushed straight, he rushed straight on the field and started uh, resuscitation. And luckily that, uh, that footballer survived. Two years ago, very interesting news item of a of a doctor who was going from Delhi to to Chennai had said had sudden cardiac arrest in the plane, and luckily there was a doctor on the plane who actually did the resuscitation measures and revived him. The doctor survived and went on to have the definitive treatment called ICT. So there are numerous episodes all over the world about such instances of how people just collapse and die suddenly. Now, let me take you to the next one. We know of many important people that who have actually died from the sudden killer. Wasim Raja died on the field, suddenly playing cricket at the age of 54. We know that Nair Hospital Dean died at the age of 57, uh, just uh, in the hospital itself. He was fine and cheerful and suddenly he could collapse and he was dead. One of our big Army Lieutenant General, ex-chief of staff, while playing golf, suddenly died on the golf course itself. And the Manoj Pund, as you know, the director, that arrest, sudden cardiac death in Dubai. And of course, you will all remember the most recent sudden cardiac arrest which happened. Uh, and our, our greatest, Bharat Ratna, uh, uh, and the past president of this country, APJ Abdul Kalam, unfortunately passed away, collapsed while giving a lecture, and had a sudden cardiac arrest in Shillong and died. So we have all these instances happening in front of our eyes, our own local footballers dying from it. We've heard of numerous episodes happening all around the world, and lives are cut short suddenly, and, and, uh, and uh, without any warning, of young people dying uh, from sudden cardiac death. So what is this sudden cardiac death? 
why do people die suddenly? Is it a heart attack or is it something else? Well, I want you to understand that heart attack can be one of the causes of sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, and 10% and of the heart attack patients do have a sudden cardiac arrest, especially in the first hour of having, having had a heart attack. But not all sudden cardiac arrests are due to heart attacks. And that's important to understand. Well, sudden cardiac arrest is a situation in which the heart stops beating. In a way, it stops supplying blood flow to the brain and rest of the body. And over a period of five to seven minutes, if the heart is arrested or stopped, then the blood circulation to the brain and other organs starts going away, and then the other vital organs start dying. And within seven minutes, unfortunately, the situation is so far gone that the body cannot be revived unless the heart is brought back to its normal functioning. So heart, as you know, is the supplier of, of all, all uh, the blood to the rest of the body. And here it is, a nice pictor pictorial representation of the heart pumping blood and the blood then goes to the brain, it goes to the rest of the body, downwards it goes to the kidney and the legs. A uh, heart starts beating in the fifth week of pregnancy, works uh, practically every second throughout your life. In fact, life stops when the heart starts beating. And it beats around a lakh times, 100,000 times a year, as the most important organ of the body for our life. If heart stops, the whole body stops in five to seven minutes. In cardiac arrest, what happens? We, why do we call it arrest? We call it arrest because the heart suddenly stops beating. It's supposed to pump blood. It's a muscular chamber, and it starts bleeding, and it stops, stop, stops beating because it can have suddenly a conduction defect with a chaotic rhythm, which becomes inefficient and does not allow the heart to pump properly and the patient collapses straight away within a few seconds and then this 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 and and if not brought back if the heart is not brought back in, in the next five minutes the person is dead here it shows that the, if the heart which was beating as you saw nicely actually suddenly goes into an ineffective beating and the ineffective beating actually results in no blood being pumped into the rest of the body in a situation of sudden cardiac arrest a sudden cardiac arrest leads to death. That's why we call it sudden cardiac death, because it occurs within five minutes. So this is what happens in a sudden cardiac arrest. Absolutely comes on without any warning, no symptoms at all. The person collapses and crashes exactly like the footballer you saw playing. Suddenly starts, he toppled over and just was there no more. And as the cardiac arrest comes in, the patient becomes unconscious and within five minutes dies. And that's it's a sudden cardiac death. It's immediate, it's collapsed, there is no pulse, there is no blood pressure, there's no breathing, there's complete loss of consciousness. Now such, there may be some warnings of a sudden cardiac arrest. And, and I will go through the medical conditions which cause it and how do we actually prevent ourselves from sudden cardiac arrest. But there can, some patients may actually have blackouts or dizziness or fainting episodes prior to sudden cardiac arrest. So, suddenly uh, the arrest comes in such a bad manner that there is no revival. Uh, so we need to understand that cardiac arrest, a sudden cardiac arrest, is popping of the heart, uh, which leads to sudden cardiac death. And a heart attack is a situation in which an artery gets blocked, a heart attack or a heart muscle starts dying, and it may intentionally patients lead to a sudden cardiac arrest but doesn't survive anyway and have treatment and go home. But in sudden cardiac arrest, the 10% who have sudden cardiac arrest cannot survive unless within that five minutes resuscitation was carried out. And that's why we say that everybody should learn and know basic life support. Basic life support means that if a person was to collapse in front of you, was to suddenly have a sudden cardiac arrest, was to have a sudden cardiac death, then you should know how to actually resuscitate those patients and it involves early cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we call it basic life support, in which case the first thing you do when a person collapses at home or in, in, at any place uh, that you see a person suddenly collapsing, you need to firstly know that you need to call help gently, suddenly 
make sure that the patient is flat on the ground, lying flat. Early, make sure that you've laid him down in a safe place that there's no track. There are no people walking over him and things like that. He's not at a vulnerable place where he's going to get hurt. And with these three things taken care of, which means you have you have called for help, you have put him flat on the ground, and thirdly, that you've got him in a safe, safe place, uh, in a safe environment, then you start resuscitation. And the resuscitation needs to start straight away. So we just make sure that his, his head is tilted up so that his airway is good. And from here on, it is, it is clearly what we call the hands-on cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. And I'm just playing you a video for you to understand that in this circumstances, all that is required is for this, this, this video to be seen as here's the collapsed person in front of you. You need to start as fast as possible. Having called somebody or having called the people around you and called ambulance services or get somebody to call the police and ambulance services, you start this massage, as we call it, the external cardiac massage. You come, put your two hands, like seen here, in the center of the breastbone, and you compress it by four to six centimeters down at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute, and you continue to do that till further help is there. Because if you stop in between, I can tell you that you cannot stop for more than 10 seconds in between because if you stop, the patient would die. And this sort of resuscitation may either get the patient back or keep him alive for a period of five to seven minutes till some help ar arrives. It's been clearly seen that this resuscitation helps people to live. And uh, And if, if oxygen is maintained to the brain, then even this sort of massage can be continued for 20 and 25 minutes if a ventilator was to put in or oxygen was supplied to the brain, then even this type of massage for even 40 minutes can keep people alive. Uh, emergency response system, and if you're in a, in a place where, where uh, in a mall, et cetera, or, a, or an airport, where in India we still have external defibrillators, as we call it, or automatic external defibrillators, and these are actually available only in, 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 uh, in some of the malls or, uh, or uh, at the airports, but to invest, they are available in many places, especially all public places have PEDs, and one can actually shock the person out of that cardiac arrest, and the person then survives. And there's actually, with, with, uh, it's with advanced uh, uh, cardiac arrest, one can actually make the people live, but one has to understand that still, despite every effort, even in advanced countries, only 10 to 15 percent of the sick people survive and out of hospital, sudden cardiac arrest. So moving on to the risk factors of understanding sudden cardiac arrest, heart attack is one of the reasons. I told you 10 percent of the people who have a heart attack at the time of having heart attack would have a sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, so it's one of the causes of sudden cardiac arrest. And most of the people, I also believe, that uh, uh, are, are luminary uh, past president uh, would have, uh, when he had a sudden cardiac arrest, would have actually had a, a heart attack uh, at that time, which led to a sudden cardiac arrest, because that is a common cause of it. But then there are other con conditions of the heart, congenital conditions of like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can lead to sudden cardiac arrest, and they are picked up on echocardiograms. And there are other situations which are very important, which means when the heart is damaged repeatedly from heart attacks, and therefore its efficiency gets weak and it gets dilated, or due to a viral infection, the heart gets dilated and baggy, then they have a higher chance of getting sudden cardiac arrest. So a diseased heart can actually has a has a higher chance of having sudden cardiac arrest, especially if the efficiency of the heart is going down. So there are valvular disease, there are not numerous disorders of conduction system of the heart. There are numerous heart diseases from birth which lead to this. But all these fall in the categories. The two common categories are heart attacks which lead to sudden cardiac arrest and then repeated damage to the heart either by a viral infection or by a pre previous heart attacks which lead to sudden cardiac arrest. So who are the people and mind you, this, this, this problem exists. The problem exists in the society. 
and clearly uh, nearly the uh, uh, lack of death occurring in cardiac arrest around us in this country and we need to understand who can be affected by sudden cardiac arrest. A person who's already had a cardiac arrest may be at risk of a higher chances of a cardiac arrest for the rest of the life. Uh, if there's a history of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death in the family, then it can be actually passed on in the, the genetics of the family and therefore uh, these are the people who should be very careful and get themselves investigated. I've already mentioned that heart attack patients and patients who've had previously multiple heart attacks are more prone to sudden cardiac arrest and those who've been affected by a viral infection affecting their heart and dropping their heart pumping efficiency down to less than 35%. The normal efficiency of the heart is 50 to 70% and those with efficiencies drop down to 35%. We call it ejection fraction of the heart are also prone to, prone to sudden cardiac arrest. So for us, the ejection fraction in, in a test called echocardiogram predicts to some extent the people who can have a sudden cardiac arrest and these are normal heart pumping efficiency is, is 50 to 75 percent. Heart attacks can drop the efficiency down but if the efficiency from repeated heart attacks or from cardiomyopathy or ejection fraction drops down to 35 percent of less then they become at a very high risk for having sudden cardiac arrest. So we know the patients who actually can be highly susceptible to sudden cardiac arrest. And therefore, we pick up these patients. It's not that everybody who is the heart pumping down to less than 35% may be prone to it. But if we actually start investigating and those who have fainting turns, who have dizzy turns and a heart pumping efficiency down to 35%, or those who have uh, on a 24-hour on a recording of the heart shown missing beats very frequently, these are the people who can have sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. There are people who document small bits of irregular beatings of the heart who can be prone to sudden cardiac arrest and of course if the, if the heart pumping efficiency goes so low that it is now one third of the normal down to less than 25 percent these are the people who are at a very high risk of sudden cardiac arrest and therefore dying from a sudden cardiac arrest. So sudden cardiac arrest we have already understood gives us no second chance. When it comes we only survive for five minutes and then die. There is no second chance in it. If we are lucky, some help may come in between and works only in 10%. And therefore, it is a single shot. Therefore, it becomes very important for us to predict those who may be at a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest. And therefore, the test that we normally do in individuals is look at the ECG because that gives us an important indication. So those who have had heart attacks, those who have got a history of sudden cardiac arrest and death in the family, those who've had pumping efficiency of the heart drop down are at a risk and should get, them, should get themselves investigated and certainly discuss with the doctor about the possibility of having a sudden cardiac arrest. ECG tells us about this. Echocardiography is very important in telling us about the pumping efficiency of the heart, the structural abnormality of the heart which brings out sudden cardiac arrest and in some cases an MRI scan also tells us about this. So these are the important investigations a doctor may put you through. Occasionally it's a 24-hour recording of the heart called 24-hour holter. And these diagnostics tests, and finally, of course, there is the angiogram and the electrophysiology study where we, in a simple procedure in the cat lab, through a local anesthesia and a puncture in the groin, are able to look at the arteries of the heart, are able to look at and study the electrical system of the heart, and are able to predict those patients who would have sudden cardiac arrest. So once we picked up somebody who can actually has a higher tendency of having sudden cardiac arrest and death, then how do we actually prevent this? Well, there are drugs, there are medicines called beta blockers, which you some, some of you know, many of the patients are already taking beta blockers. In fact, it's perhaps the most important medication which is given to a heart attack patient or to a patient who has such discomfort or angina. And it is an efficient medicine to actually at least to an extent, prevent sudden cardiac arrest and death. There are certain electrophysiology treatments, electrical treatments of the heart, 
where one can actually burn those abnormal pathways and prevent uh, the heart from going into an chaotic, irregular beating, uh, which causes sudden cardiac arrest. So there are some electrical methodologies of treatment as well, again done simply through under local anesthesia, uh, almost like angiography. But the most important treatment, I would say, is, is and the most important life-saving device ever created is what we call an ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Now, many of you have seen that uh, either in the movies or in reality or somewhere or in some serial where a person suddenly collapses and then they put these two paddles on the chest and then electrical current is given and they show the patient jumping up and suddenly the patient is revived. The doctor calls for these two paddles and suddenly he gets a shock. Well, that shock is the way we revive the sudden cardiac arrest. And majority of the sudden cardiac arrest can be revived by giving a shock. And that is why you see these external defibrillators in airports, in, at airports, in busy areas, etc., where if a person was to collapse, then the external defibrillator can revive them in majority of the patients. But, the, but unfortunately, those are not available everywhere. And that's why people keep dying. And that's why uh, many of the people who will be talking about died because there was no defibrillator. And in fact, no even resuscitated them. That's unfortunate. Nobody was able to resuscitate them. Uh, so this implantable defibrillator is the same shocking machine, except that it now comes by the advancements of science and technology, comes in a miniaturized, miniaturized form, which is no more than a, a little uh, three centimeter ring, I would say, and no more than, than half a centimeter in thickness. And it can be implanted under the skin, right under the shoulder blade, under the skin, with just two wires going to the heart. And with these two wires, this device actually works like a shock system. It actually shocks the heart any time when the heart goes into a sudden cardiac arrest situation and prevents the patient from dying. Perhaps the most important, efficient, life-saving therapy ever been created in, in, in medical science. Uh, so here's the how. Uh, let's see this this footballer. And this is the footballer. This is the British footballer I was talking to you about. The British footballer was resuscitated on the field by a doctor who did basic life support. And uh, I think we'll have a look at it. That's the that's, that's the guy here, and he's dead. Every minute is ticking by. Somebody comes. And, and yes, he he came out of it. He collapsed. He came out of it, and this person then had an ICD implant, okay? And then subsequently was able to close. So he survived this. Similarly, the patient in, in, in UK, the, the footballer in UK, also survived. What is this? You probably don't want to do it. Patient in, in UK survived because of resuscitation, went to the hospital, had an ICD, and they could be for lip So, this is what an ICD is. Here's the little box under the shoulder blade. Here are the two wires going into it. The heart is beating normally, and suddenly it goes into the chaotic, sudden cardiac arrest has started. This device is sensing it and suddenly gives a shock. You just saw that happen and the heart actually starts beating again. Again, let's go through this. Heart is beating normally. A sudden cardiac arrest is about to start. Here it goes into fibrillation as we call it. Heart is ineffective. This device senses it. It gives a shock. It gives a shock and there it is. The heart is revived back. All this occurs within a minute because I just said if the heart was to do the same thing for five minutes, the, the person is dead, the brain is gone, the brain is irreparably damaged. And therefore, this all the device does is within a minute, understands it, senses it, and then delivers the shock. This is perhaps the most fascinating device. Uh, so we actually know that people who are going to benefit from this device, which is a life-saving device, 
are people with ejection fractions of heart pumping efficiency drop down to less than 30 percent either due to cardiomyopathy either due to repeated heart attacks <clears throat> there are other people who have got a family history of sudden cardiac death arrhythmias who also benefit from this device and for anybody who we predict could have a sudden cardiac death sudden cardiac death does not give a second chance a sudden cardiac arrest does not give a second chance it is death and therefore we want to predict it and therefore we want that people who in whom the prediction suggests that they would have a second uh, have a sudden cardiac arrest need to have the device to be able to uh, survive subsequently and it's certainly been been shown to be the most efficient device in making people live uh, prevention, of course, is paramount. That the heart disease in your is on your own hands. Uh, prevention from heart disease is the most important thing, and in this world, heart day messages of prevention. We know that you should seek a doctor's situation, so doctor's help, as soon as possible when there's chest discomfort. Uh, many people have a heart attack and keep spending time. Uh, and delaying going to the doctor where the heart continues to damage the heart muscle because they keep thinking it's indigestion. Sometimes while a heart attack is severe, sudden compression of the chest with a lot of sweating, it sometimes mimics uh, indigestion and acidity. And some of the people just delay going to the hospital. In fact, recent studies suggest that 80% of the people delay going to the hospital because they keep thinking indigestion and continue to treat themselves. Don't do that. Even if it is indigestion and you can get an ECG, if the indigestion lasts for half an hour and doesn't get relieved by normal indigestion medicines, it is better to go to the hospital and have an ECG done. And if the ECG is normal, at least it's relieved you of the issue. Never feel yourself foolish. Early treatment saves your heart muscle and prevents sudden cardiac arrest. Similarly, shortness of breath, breathlessness and walking, if it is recent, well, it could be an indicator of heart disease and you should see a doctor. Uh, cough, breathlessness with cough, it can be chest infection, but it can be also due to the heart. Dizziness, sudden uh, cold sweats, uh, sudden momentary loss of understanding or consciousness, swelling over the feet, lack of energy, could all be symptoms of heart disease in which you should be able to see a doctor and take his advice about uh, further investigations to see whether it's heart disease or not heart disease. We know that there are numerous aspects of, of uh, risk factors for coronary artery disease, but I need to emphasize this again to you all. People who are prone to have heart disease, these are the risk factors, a family history of coronary artery disease, which is a, mo a risk factor you can't modify. You cannot modify your parents, and therefore you just have to understand that you have to modify yourself and your lifestyle if you're born in a family which already has heart attacks and heart disease or sudden cardiac arrest. Smoking is bad, in really the most important and bad cause for, for heart attacks. High blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, being overweight, being, leading a sedentary habit, diabetes, Stress and excess alcohol are all risk factors for having heart attacks or having sudden cardiac arrest. So I think if you have to be sensible, you have to have healthy heart habits. You know the, 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 the our motto for the World Heart Day has been heart healthy environments. You need to make your environment heart healthy. Even at work you have to have heart healthy habits like climbing stairs like not just having gup, gup shop over a cup of tea but utilizing that time to even half an hour to be able to do a treadmill exercise during that time. Sitting around and lazing is bad. You need to actually have habits of actually walking or cycling to work in many instances and if you can't do that at least parking at a distance from your work site so that you can actually walk to work. You need to create a non-smoking atmosphere in the in your in your workplaces. No, even somebody else smoking, even if you don't smoke, somebody else smoking, and and you just your taking those fumes in is extremely bad and can cause you heart disease and lung problems. So passive smoking, as we call it, has also got risk of heart disease. 
you need to actually create heart healthy environment through food as well the right sort of food avoiding fried and fatty foods avoiding cakes pastries fast foods store foods all those are rich in trans fats eating out has to be occasional because food outside especially especially in in the various sweet shops especially various uh, restaurants and salvais are all trans rich in trans fats which is the most dangerous fat for the heart so regular exercise of walking 40 minutes at least five times a week decreases your incidence of having a heart attack or even a sudden cardiac arrest by 25% so we have to have good habits don't uh, the the healthy lifestyle blood pressure is the biggest killer it's actually a silent killer and you actually should get your blood pressure checked regularly everybody above the age age of 18 should have their bp checked actually once it is the biggest killer it causes heart attacks it causes heart failures it causes strokes it causes kidney failures it causes it causes blindness in fact blood pressure is actually even a bigger killer or a cause of killing than than uh, heart heart disease itself so you need to actually keep an eye on the blood pressure and if the blood, if you have your blood pressure checked by the age of 18 and then yearly thereafter diabetes needs control because again it's it's a silent killer and therefore that is another important aspect so look after your cholesterol levels uh so that you are spared of the heart disease we actually unfortunately live in the third most obese country in the world with with the highest incidence of abdominal obesity with the highest incidence of raised cholesterol with the highest incidence of diabetes and the highest incidence of blood pressure a recent survey we did showed that 33% of the our population actually suffers from high blood pressure we did the survey on the 21st uh, by the cardiological society of india and the survey of 1.8 lakh people is the biggest survey ever conducted in the history of the world it actually showed us that 33% of our population has high blood pressure and the 66% don't even know that they have high blood pressure and therefore look at the in the sadness that the people who don't know they have high blood pressure are gradually going to damage their organs and at some stage have a heart attack even without knowing that they were going to go for a heart attack only if they got the blood pressures controlled they would have avoided heart attack by at least 50% chance that they would have had a heart attack or a heart attack so prevention perhaps is paramount in this country while the treatment options are available and we have investigations which can often tell us those who are at risk and those who we should treat prophylactically so that they don't suffer from extremely serious heart problems or even sudden cardiac arrest our responsibility lies around uh, preventing heart disease because that's the most efficient way to live longer and uh, and therefore and live strongly so therefore uh, say no to success as far as i'm concerned and these success keep that in mind sugar salt and saturated and trans fats remember these three s's sugar salt and saturated fats including trans fats and the remaining three s's are smoking sedentary lifestyle and stress and if you take care of this and keep remembering this day after day you will actually prevent heart disease and live longer and live better therefore with this message i say that uh, heart disease is the real color killer we always feel that it would affect somebody else actually heart disease can affect any of any of you at any time it may come on as a heart attack it may come on as an angina and occasionally it may come come on as sudden cardiac arrest and death and give you no chance and therefore please start understanding that responsibility of keeping yourself away from heart disease is in your own hands any amount of government expenditure on any policies is not going to take away the efficiency of the way you yourself can prevent heart disease even just simple simple policy of, of yours as brisk walking for 45 minutes five times a week can decrease the chances of a heart attack by 25% therefore you must actually make sure that your habits are good and that you follow the six s that i've just outlined thank you very much for listening to me
Okay, I'm 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 open to questions. I know that you want to ask me many questions. I'm ready to answer any questions that you may want. And so please keep, feel free to to do so. We have uh, a couple of questions from social media. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So this question is from Adam. He's asking, uh, most of the people who get heart elements after 30, and can we know any do-it-yourself simple methods and checks to find whether our heart is in good So firstly, I would want to let you know that the the Heart disease used to be traditionally thought of as a disease of the elderly, or at least beyond the age of 60s and 70s. But I, over the last 20 years, heart disease in the young has risen by 10 times, which means that people between the age of 20 to 40 are getting prone to heart attacks and heart disease. Because 50% of our youth is less than 30, we are worried that as time progresses, this youth will actually suffer in a big way from heart attacks. Uh, while I've told you, and this is for every youth, as to how to keep yourself heart healthy, do regular exercise, eat the right diet, no smoking, uh, moderation in alcohol, and uh, control of diabetes, uh, food, obesity. Uh, but the most important thing is that, yes, if you have a family history of heart problems, to have a family history of sudden cardiac death. Your family history or your brothers or sisters have had heart attacks, or your parents have had a heart attack at an early age, or you have diabetes, then you must get regular checkups done. And the regular checkups means that if you visit a heart specialist, even at the age of 25, if you actually have a, have a family history of heart attacks at an early age, the cardiologist is, is going to put you through a test of your blood cholesterol levels, an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound scan of the heart, and an exercise test, which is a TMT. And with these three tests, your blood test, an echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound scan, simple external test of the heart, and an exercise test on a treadmill, one is able to pick up at least 80% of the people who suffer from, or are expected to suffer from heart disease in the future. Uh, this question is from Kaval Gandhi. Is there a non-invasive procedure to check blockage, and what are the side effects? So the non-invasive procedure, which gives indications whether a serious blockage is present or not, are firstly simple thing like exercise test, TMT. This is, this is available practically in every small and big city. It's easily available test. It has a sensitivity of around 60% to be able to tell you whether you have a serious or an important blockage in the arteries of the heart. But it also has a false positive of nearly 30% and false negatives of 40%. Therefore, it doesn't mean that if you actually have turned out to have a positive test, means that there could be 30-40% chance that you don't have a problem. So it's simple, easily available, cheap test with with uh, uh, moderate sensitivity. Uh, but then beyond that are tests called exercise thallium scans, where one or a stress echocardiogram. Yeah. where one goes on the treadmill but either an echo is done at the same time or a nuclear scan is done at the same time which has a sensitivity of close to 80 to 90 percent to pick up heart blockages or serious heart blockages. We have a non-invasive angiogram called the CT scan or a CT angiography in which actually blockages are seen while the previous tests I've told you are indirect measures and become show and uh, this interpreted from them is the fact that serious blockages are there the CT can actually show blockages, but when it shows blockages, the percentages are not very accurate, and therefore it can actually determine whether a person has mild, moderate, or severe blockage, and then further tests need to be done to evaluate that. Of course, the final answer is, is the invasive test of angiography, which tells us very clearly as to the percentage of blockages and, uh, and to what extent they are, and what sort of treatment options then can we give such patients. Uh, uh, at Angela. So we normally go through this series of investigative processes uh, uh, 
and reserve the angiography only for ones who we believe have serious blockages and therefore would benefit from treatment uh, of those blockages. And that's when we use angiography. Uh, Amar Kishore Wani is asking, is cholesterol all that bad? Everything has positive and negative effects. What are positive, positive things about cholesterol? So there are two aspects to this. There's the blood cholesterol and then there's the cholesterol in your diet. There's no doubt that the blood cholesterol has five elements into it. Of the five elements, there is a good cholesterol and there is a bad cholesterol in the blood itself. So LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol, is bad. It affects coronary arteries. In fact, these are actually the transporters of cholesterol. Low-density lipoprotein, we call it. They're not cholesterol itself. They're the transporters of cholesterol. But anyway, this bad LDL actually is clearly shown that the higher the bad LDL, the worse is the outlook of developing heart disease and blockages. And the lower the LDL is made, the bad LDL, or the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, is, is brought down, the, the lesser the likelihood of developing heart attacks for the future. So that has been clearly shown. Then there's a good cholesterol as well, called the HDL. And one tries all the time to so that the HDL, it's a protective cholesterol, and therefore one actually wants to praise that. But that has to be dissociated from cholesterol in the diet. Normally it has been seen that if the cholesterol-rich diet does affect the, body, the blood cholesterol. But even in the cholesterol-rich diet, it's not every cholesterol which is bad. But there are certain real bad cholesterols in the diet, and that's why we keep emphasizing about the trans fats. Trans fats in diet are perhaps the worst cholesterol, and you don't see it. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the cholesterol which is actually present. It's the fat and cholesterol which is present in, in recooked oils, in, in solidified oils, in shelf uh, in, in food which is kept on shelves and preserved over months, they have the worst form of, uh, of preservative and cholesterol in them. That's called trans fats. It's in foods at restaurants, in, in, uh, and, and West has dictated as to what's a trans, what is the percentage of trans fats which they, they should be a food in restaurants. But unfortunately, we don't have any legis legislations to tell you that some of those food that we eat in many of the restaurants or many of the fast food shops could actually have very high levels of trans fat, which is harming our, uh, our, our so so not every cholesterol is bad and that's why having the occasional two three teaspoonful of ghee you know, every day also is not bad because that's not a bad cholesterol similarly we talk about yellow apples you're having the yellow pills through the is not bad because that's not bad cholesterol nuts are not bad but then there are huge large amounts of bad cholesterol in the diet in fact some of the refined sugars are equally bad. So dietary food is a different aspect than the blood cholesterol levels. And dietary food of all forms, not just fat in dietary food, even the calories in dietary food can affect the cholesterol level of the blood. So we always try to get the blood cholesterol level down and try to do with high cholesterol foods or low cholesterol food. It's to do with the right food. And if we eat the right food, and if we've got a balanced diet, and if we eat food which are rich in vegetables and, and fruits, if we eat foods which are low in trans fats, if we eat foods which are low in refined sugars, then we actually have healthy, healthy food. Uh, this question is from Saraskar Pati. Is it true that one uh, reaches to old age, heart muscles get weak and could lead to uneven heart rate? Uh, what are the possible risks and any proactive measures to avoid the pain? Right. What is true is that blockages in the arteries of the heart is an aging process. Just like we develop arthritis, just like we develop white hair, just like we develop wrinkling of the skin, so do blockages in the arteries of the heart. So when the person at the age of 75 or 80 asks me, why did I develop blockages in my arteries? Why did I have a heart attack? I clearly tell him that it's a normal aging process. The fact that you've got, you've got a blockage is not at all at all surprising. It's when it happens in young age, less than the age of 55, is when we see this is un unnatural, this is abnormal. That's when we get worried and that's where the risk factors are all about. Uh, as far as no, the heart doesn't get weak as it ages. It only develops blockages, but the heart remains still functioning strong. When the blockages cause a heart attack, 
and the heart gets damaged, that's when it starts getting weak. But yes, it is true that even on a strong heart, one can get irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias as age goes on. Atrial fibrillation, uh, ectopics, but these are non-serious arrhythmias. So aging brings on non-serious arrhythmias of the heart, but aging and aging brings on blockages of the arteries of the heart. Aging brings on for more possibility of heart attack, but aging by itself doesn't weaken the heart. The next question is from Ravi Radha Krishnan. Uh, he is saying, I am 52. I have recently had a pregnant ECG done and was given an all clear in that. Am I all clear or do I need some more tests? So, say that again. He had a what? He had a treadmill done. Yeah. You can, can you repeat that question? Uh, he is saying, I am 52. I have recently had a treadmill ECG done. And uh, the report was all clear. So, he is asking, am I all clear or do I need some more tests? So you're 52 and if you're totally asymptomatic, you are able to walk and you have no risk factors. That means there's no family history of a heart attack or a heart disease. There is uh, no diabetes. You're not a smoker. You're not overweight. You not, don't have high blood pressure and your treadmill test is negative. Then I don't think you need any further investigation. We can be close to 90% certain that you haven't got a serious heart problem. At all. You should all, always get I'm done as well. But if you actually had <coughs> diabetes or high, for a long time or high blood pressure or had some symptoms of discomfort, then we need to understand that treadmill test is only 60% accurate. Its sensitivity is only 60%. It may miss out people who've got blockages in 30-40% of the patients, in which case we always suggest that if you have, have multiple risk factors, then it is better to get the more sophisticated test like an express echo or an exercise thallium scan done which have a greater accuracy of 80 to 90 percent. It's just that these two tests which I've talked about are available in specialist cardiology hospitals while a TMP is available in every 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 small hospital. So with risk factors, you if you if your chances of having a heart disease are more, get the more accurate test done. Uh, this question is from Sandeep Gupta. Uh, he is asking for treating hypertension, which is one of the risk factors. Is it better to treat with a beta blocker than other drugs? Because with a beta blocker, you are, you are also covering SC. Uh, so, if you have already got heart disease, then we prefer to treat high blood pressure with beta blockers. But if there is no heart disease, then beta blocker is not a good first line drug for high blood pressure. We consider the other drugs like calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and thiazide diuretics as a better agent for treatment of blood pressure. So only if a heart disease is already present, we know that there are blockages, we know that there is angina, or there's been a heart attack, and blood pressure coexists, then beta blocker is definitely the best first line treatment for both blood pressure as well as treatment of heart disease as well as protection from, from sudden cardiac death. Uh, we have so many questions, we will take a few more. Uh, this is from Manoj Menon. He uh, is asking, doctor, doctor, with the, all the awareness programs, both knowing and not knowing, people still do not follow basic health advices like this. How can we ensure more people follow health advices? This is by understanding that the heart disease can actually affect you. In India, unfortunately, everybody is counteractive. People always believe that everything happens to the other. If there's going to be a theft, people believe it's going to be happening to somebody else, the neighbor. When the theft happens in your own house, then you start getting house insurances. Uh, people always feel that they don't wear helmets or seat belts because somebody else is going to have a head injury. When your head injury occurs, that's when you start wearing helmets or seat belts. But by that time, it's too late. It's very important to realize that heart disease is going to affect everybody close to you. By this time, somebody close to you, one of your relatives or one of your friends already had heart disease and you know of it. One day, it is just going to affect you. And that's a reality. You would actually suddenly wake up one day and it would be a heart attack. So understanding that all of us are like loaded guns, ready to actually fire into a heart attack any day 
uh, we need to understand that we need to take precautions. And the precautions are the ones which can actually decrease our chances by at least 25 to 30 percent of having a heart attack or something. And that's why we've got to do it. By the time heart attacks already strike, it's already, if we have a heart attack, by then it's too late. From there on, any amount of diet, exercise, saying sorry, I wish I'd done it, it's not going to get us back. The heart muscle gets damaged, our longer day of life gets limited, we die earlier if we have a heart attack. So we need to avoid it. Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, we'll take this last question. Yes, we'll take the last question. This is from Ankur Gal. Uh, he's asking, due to hectic office schedule, what are the activities or actions one can perform during office hours to minimize chances for OCD? Very good. I think that's a very good question, and I'm, ho I'm happy you've asked that question because it relates to, to heart healthy lifestyle and heart healthy environment at work. See, every working place, every employee, needs to make his 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 office offices heart healthy and employees be able to actually take advantage of that. It's very important to actually have a treadmill or a little gym in the office spaces for people to be able to use that in the twenty minute break that they have, in the half, half an hour break that they have, a tea break that they may have in the afternoon, for them to be able to exercise for twenty minutes on the treadmill. Using stairs, combining walks to from your your car to or your your transport to the 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 workplace, all that if that can add up to three to four kilometers of walking, uh, that is enough to be able to decrease your risk of heart disease. So even at workplaces, making your workplaces non-smoking, making sure that the canteens actually have food which is low. In, in trans fats, making sure that you don't take fizzy drinks, sweet drinks, uh, and cakes and pastries and biscuits and fried food during the snack breaks, and making sure that you exercise actually is the biggest thing that you can do during the work hours to prevent your heart disease. And that's what you should actually propagate to other units as well. Every, any of your friends and any of the workplaces you meet, you should just keep saying these four factors can actually help you to make heart healthy. So I think we, we are at a uh, at, uh, few minutes past four. I think it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I know that you all have numerous questions and if we, um, the questions kept coming I could actually keep going on also for the next couple of hours but unfortunately I have to go and attend to some cases and I know you need to get back to your other work so perhaps another day we will meet once again and talk more about heart disease. Thank you very much.